Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TRT and Hormone Optimization YouTube channel. Uh, my name is Danny Bossa, and I'm joined today with Dr. Jordan Grant. How are you, Jordan? I'm fine, Danny. Thank you for having me. Welcome to this channel. I am Dr. Steven De Vos, the lifting dermatologist, and this is my bro science hunting partner, Danny Bossa. If you want to learn more about the most cutting edge science based information in the world of hormone optimization, please like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you won't miss anything. I also invite you to join my other YouTube channel, The Lifting Dermatologist. The link you can find in the description of this video. Cool. Uh, so I made a, a post in the group in regards to who you guys would like to see on the channel, and Jordan's been in the group for quite some time. He's one of our top commenters and he's got a ton of experience. Uh, he does this. Uh, Part of this TRT stuff for a living. Uh, so I wanted to have him come on and just kind of get an idea who he was. We've just kind of spoken through the group and through Messenger, but uh, I thought you guys might just see a, a bit of a one on one. So, uh, Jordan. Yes, sir. How did, you, uh, how did you get into this stuff? How did you? This is probably a question you get asked a million times, but you know, you're in medical school and you decide to become a urologist. How does one decide, yeah. you know, I want to become a urologist? I get that a lot. Um, I'd probably back up a little bit because, and this will probably answer a question you were going to ask later anyway about hormones. But so I got into hormones when I was probably 17, uh, you know, doing the weightlifting stuff, getting into looking into anabolic steroids, like, but I was one of those guys that, and the internet was in its pretty infancy at that point. And I started just devouring like, okay, what are these things? I researched them. Unlike a lot of my friends and other guys, they just take in whatever the local gym guy says, here, take this. Um, I wanted to know what I was doing and I became fascinated with the hormone side of things. And I dabbled with that stuff through college and then kind of didn't do anything after that. But I knew even then looking into hormones, like urologists deal with hormones. So I kind of put that in the back of my head. But I went to college, got a business degree, didn't go to med school straight away. And, um, I worked for a year in Houston and then I decided I wanted to go to med school because I was always a science lover and just inquisitive minded. Um, and so I had to go do, do everything all over again, prerequisites. Anyway, it took about four years and I started med school at 27. So once I was in med school, I kind of had a feeling I wanted to be a surgeon just because I enjoyed working with my hands. Um, at first I thought I wanted to do orthopedics. I mean, everybody thought I would. I was kind of semi-muscular at the time oh you look like an orthopedic surgeon blah 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 um but i guess it was my second year of med school i got put into a, what's called a continuity clinic where once a week you go to a, a clinic they assign you and it happened to be urology and this was at texas tech out in lubbock texas um and man they were just the coolest guys like the personalities were really interesting the surgeries were really fun i mean blasting the stones and taking out kidneys and you know, all that I didn't see a lot of the hormone replacement side of it, but I was just going once a week. So um, I started narrowing things down because you kind of got to make a decision in med school mm -hmm. early on if you want to, what, what you want to do. And so third year rolls around, we're doing rotations. I do an elective with urology. I love it. So I kind of at that point said, okay, I want to do urology. And uh, fourth year, we do these away rotations at different places to see if, you know, you want to really, where you might want to match in residency. And anyway, I, where I eventually went to residency was in Temple, Texas. It's called Scott and White. It's now Baylor Scott and White. But um, I rotated there. I loved it and, you know, matched there and got into my residency. So, and that's where I met my wife, actually. So she was a year ahead of me. Um, the hormone side of things came about, like I said, I've always been interested in it. I kind of had a feeling I was low T, actually, even through med school. And I think it was my fourth year of med school. I got my labs checked and I was at like 3.30. And of course, I'm told you're normal, you know, and I, even then I kind of knew that's not normal. It's not right. But I didn't do anything about it. And then I think by third year of residency, I was feeling crummy. I got my labs checked. It was, they were at 300. And I thankfully had one of my staff because I was a resident at the time. He was, he wrote me a prescription, got me on TRT. Um, and it was pretty life changing at that point. So, um, at that point, I started being more of an advocate for TRT, even in residency. You know, you have your own clinics, even though you're over, people are overseeing you. And I was kind of the lone wolf in the residency crew of being really pro TRT. Everybody kind of looked at me like I was crazy. I think it was maybe 2015 around then when, when Dr. Morgan Tyler came out with the saturation theory about prostate cancer and how testosterone does not cause it. And I mean, all these light bulbs just started going off. Um, so that's, 
anyway, that's, that's how I got into urology. You know, urology, it, it was funny how I, I came to urology because I loved the surgeries and I loved the personalities, but I'd always loved hormones too. And so it just, it just fit together perfect. And the fact that there aren't a lot of people specializing in hormones, I felt like, you know, I'm passionate about it. I'm, I'm on TRT. I know how it feels. Um, and so I can help these guys that maybe nobody else is willing to help. So it wasn't just the, the hormones itself. It was the mix of, I wanted to use my hands and I wanted to potentially do surgeries and I wanted to do all these things and the hormones because otherwise potentially yeah. you would have become an endo or you would have become a, uh, you know, like I mean, a, I don't know what else. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, you know, the functional medicine guys now like Dr. Nichols, I mean, obviously they're doing it that I didn't know. There's not really a residency for that, I guess, specifically. Right. Um, but yeah, for me, it was the, I wanted to be a surgeon. Urology is a very rewarding field because yeah, we deal with cancers, but a lot of the cancers are cured with surgery. So it's not as much of a, a depressing field as mm -hmm. uh, some of the other ones. Um, the, the call is not terrible. Um, it can be, but it's not bad. And um, we do some really cool stuff. I mean, just the, the toys, you know, is what attracts a lot of people to urology because we, you know, drive scopes up the ureter to blast the stone with a laser, but, and then but we can still cut people open and take, you know, kidneys out or whatever. So it's, um, it's rewarding though. I mean, I do a lot of prostate surgery for men with BPH a lot, and it's great seeing guys going from miserable to happy. And it's the same with TRT. It's that obviously there's, I guess it's selfish because I'm feeling happy about it because it, it's rewarding, but that's life. I, I love it. I love seeing men and women if they have stones, obviously, but people going from, not well to well with a, you know, with a surgery or with hormone treatment. I mean, it's just, it's very rewarding. Um, and I get to follow my patients more in clinic as opposed to like general surgery. A lot of those people see you once for an emergency, you know, you do the surgery, see them post-op and then they're gone. Whereas urology, we've got continuity for a lot of people, their prostate cancer follow-up, their TRT follow-up, their kidney stone follow-up for years. So they become your patients for life. And I love that about it. I think that's a big reason a lot of, urologists have gone on urology is for the continuity. Okay. So how did you, how long have you been on TRT exactly? Oh, let's see. That, that, that period where you said that you're in the 300s or? Right when I started dating Leah, uh, 2014. Yeah, I think it was 2014, a few months after we had started dating. It was June of 2000, maybe 14 or 15. So I feel like it's been like five, five and a half years. Something like and that. do you recall what the what protocol you started on or what they were telling he, you to do back yeah, then? He was very generous, uh, very cool guy, one of my staff, and uh, he didn't do a lot of TRT, you know, but he, he's like 200 milligrams a week. I was like, all right. And uh, I already, you know, was looking, you know, I knew about hormones. I knew about dosing protocols a little better. So I just split it up and did 100 milligrams every three or three and a half days. I'm pretty anal. So I made it, you know, Saturday morning, Tuesday evening, like not anal retentive like that. Um, and honestly, I've been doing that protocol ever since then. Um, and just now, I guess in the last, what, six months when the cream has been talked about more and I've been, I've been, and we can talk about this, been using that a lot more on my patients. I'm tempted to make the switch just to see how a daily dosing might feel. Have you, because you're seeing a, a benefit going from the injections to the cream with your patients? Absolutely. And none of my guys, and I have a different patient population than, a lot of places probably. I mean, we're in a small town, good old, good old country folk for the most part, you know, these guys don't want to inject daily, so they're not going to be experimenting. I mean, it's hard enough to talk them into injecting twice a week. Um, so if I can get them on the daily dosing of the cream, most of them will go along with that if they can afford it. Um, and they really do notice a difference. The lab work has been just ridiculously impressive. I know we don't, you know, we don't treat based on labs, but it's good to have follow-up just to make sure they're absorbing it. I have had a few guys that don't absorb the cream. Um, one, I think out of the, in the last couple of months, just one guy, no matter where he put it, scrotal first. And then we tried other places. He just, he was putting it on properly. It's just something about his skin, I guess. Um, this was from Empower Pharmacy. Uh, so I knew it was a good quality cream. Um, but yeah, I have seen a huge difference in, in men's symptoms, their sex drive, just like everything that we talk about online. I see it, you know, the free tea uh, is, is exponentially larger with the daily cream. Um, so it's, it's awesome to see that. So I'm, I'm very tempted to take the dive. And are, are you seeing, um, how can I explain it? Are you using any kind of, do you have some kind of a, a guideline in your head as to I'm going to give them the cream and I'm, I want them to be about here. Cause I think this will, 
kind of fix them up? Or is it really just, I'm just going to start you at a standard uh, dose of X yeah. and then we'll address it. If you've got no symptoms, great, we leave it alone yeah. regardless of your yeah. labs or. Yeah. Go ahead. So like, would you say, you know, I, I try to get their, you know, free up until you know, this range. I find that this is where it's better. Or is it really just purely ba based on symptoms and, and that's it? A lot of it is symptoms. Um, you know, we'll get, and, and I was kind of screwing up at first, not screwing up, but when I was doing the cream, I'd have them just do three clicks all in the morning. And I was seeing crazy levels with the three clicks and, you know, levels you don't want to really keep people at. That's probably not optimal. I mean, most are okay, but I, I saw one guy that was like in the two, mid 2000s. I mean, it's like, that's, you don't need to keep somebody there. I don't think there may be a rare occasion. Somebody needs that for their free tea to get up, but he was like, and he had had some water retention, all that. So I was like, okay, we're going to drop it down. And my newest protocol is really starting with two, two clicks in the morning, no matter what. And then one to two in the evening as desired. So, you know, they get, you know, a month supply that's up four clicks a day. And so they can kind of titrate things based on how they feel. And most guys I'm seeing do best with two in the morning, one in the evening. I've had some guys that'll drop it to one and one because they just felt too anxious or they, you know, they didn't like the water retention or whatever. And then I'll slowly maybe try to get them to dial up to two and then one. Um, as far as labs, you know, this first set of labs that'll come back after four weeks, usually they're, you know, 1200 with a free tea over 20. And I say, how you feeling? They're like, I'm doing well. And, we just keep them rolling with that. Um, right. Now, obviously, the longer you're on it, the better you're going to feel, too. So it's hard to base a lot off of those first labs. That's more of me just checking to see, okay, how is he responding to the cream as far as blood levels? But over time, as long as they're not in some crazy high range and they're feeling well, that's it. We just roll with it. I mean, that's what I tell guys. It's kind of a – my philosophy is pretty simple. And once you dial somebody in and they feel decent, and they're still going to have bad days, they're still going to be sleepy, they're still going to have days where their sex drives crap. I mean, it's going to happen based on life, but I think TRT is pretty much a, a set it and forget it type of thing. Like it's just another part of your daily routine, like taking vitamins. In my opinion. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. That's even for the whole uh, injection thing. It's, you know, people say, I don't see how you're doing these injections every day. And I'm like, once you've been doing it for a while, you know, I have all my stuff just in one drawer. I just pull it out. My needle is loaded up within 15 seconds, yeah. you know, and sit, sit, done. It Are you takes doing me less time to, to, to do the injection than it does to brush my teeth. Really? Yeah. yeah. And, that's, and that's why I have no excuse not to do the cream. Cause I always tell, I'm just lazy. I don't want to do it every day. It's no different than brushing your teeth every day. You just do it yeah. and it becomes part of your life. Um, are you doing IM or sub Q? I'm experimenting and I'm experimenting based on, for me, I found that I needed a really high dose to get my free tea up to something that where I felt like my symptoms resolve. Yeah. And I was starting to wonder if maybe I'm one of those types that doesn't absorb enough of it through sub Q. Uh, all the studies I'm seeing where they compared subcutaneous injections and intramuscular injections, the amount uh, that was absorbed was very, very, very similar. They found virtually no difference. And they recommended subcutaneous simply based on the fact that they found that easier for people to do at home. Uh, you're not worrying about hitting a you know, blood vessel or an artery or whatever the hell it is. You're just going straight in the, in the fat. Um, and also because I never really, like I was a huge wuss when it came to needles and I, I had a very hard time with IM. That sensation of it going through the muscle just yeah. kind of freaked me out a bit. Um, but lately, I guess maybe it's the, the testosterone that's getting me to man up. I've started experimenting with doing some of it uh, sub Q and some of it intramuscularly gotcha. to see if I feel just general feeling any, any different. And I've only just started that recently. It's hard to tell. Okay. Um, so outside of the, outside of the standard cream, mm -hmm. um, has anything changed in regards to your outlook on stuff, maybe on other supplementation or controlling estrogen? Uh, I know we yeah. talked about this so time we can, yeah. yeah, we can harp on the estrogen thing because I think it's important. Um, and I'm, a, I'm probably one of the loudest mouths in the group about, but besides you, uh, <laughs> on, uh, on estradiol. Um, I was, because I was in that camp of you got to control it. You know, I mean, I, when I started getting into all this stuff in residency and I started devouring everything, I came across, you know, several guys on YouTube. There's one out in California that's a TRT doctor. Um, 
he treats a lot of bodybuilders and he, you know, he always talked about controlling estradiol, keeping it between 20 and 30. And I'm thinking, okay. Cause I, I mean, we're not taught this stuff in residency, especially anything about estradiol and all that stuff. So, all right, well, I'll do that. So, you know, I, I'm on my TRT of 200 milligrams a week and I'm thinking I got to control my estrogen. So I got aromacin. I'm taking that like every other day and I never felt great, you know, right away. Um, and I would fluctuate and I'd forget to take it sometimes. And I, but I still never paid attention to how I was feeling until probably a, a couple years into it. I was really trying to control it. And I, got, I just was feeling terrible. And I was dieting at the time. This was last year of residency. I had lost 52 pounds that year, stressed out for board and crashing my estrogen. And I finally checked it and it was less than seven. Um, I felt terrible. Um, and so finally I was like, you know what? I, I don't think I need this. And then when we were in Shreveport where we worked there for two years, Shreveport, Louisiana in private practice, um, I still was kind of of this mindset. Well, maybe we need to control estradiol. So I had a guy come in and cause he just never felt really dialed in on his TRT and he was a little overweight, but nothing crazy. His estradiol was over a hundred. So I freaked out. I was like, Oh, we got to get you on a Remedex. And I did that and he came back to see me, I don't know, a month later. He's like, doc, I'm not better. Like I'm worse. And I was like, okay, this, this is crap, you know? Um, so we just stopped the Reminex. We changed his dose. He felt better after just giving it time. And, that, and then light bulbs kind of started going off like, all right, these guys don't need AIs. And then I would get referred some guys in town who just weren't really dialed in when they weren't feeling well. Cause there was another guy in town doing a lot of PRT, but he kind of did the standard protocol stuff. Nice guy. Um, but if he kind of couldn't figure things out, I'd see him. And first thing I do, I'd notice, oh, you're on an AI. Stop the AI. See me in a month. That's it. Uh, you know, if they're, if they're not injecting frequently enough, we, we did change that. But definitely stop the AI. It was like, I mean, then the light bulbs really started going off. When you see these guys back, they're like, Doc, I feel great. I'm a new person. I mean, I'm getting erections again. You know, I don't feel the brain fog. My joints aren't hurting. I mean, all the stuff we talk about now. But to yeah. then, it was like, it was newer to me. So ever since then, I stopped blocking it. And then just this year, come across, you know, Dr. Rousier's videos on all the association studies that, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense. And then I started looking into it, into actual, and I posted these papers on the, recently on the uh, group. And this is a big deal. And I wish more guys would devour. I wish we could make these things a sticky on there so that they have to see them every time is how estradiol in men actually works. And I can explain it real briefly. And I'm not saying I'm an expert on it, um, but I've got like three or four decent, you know, biochem type papers on this. So basically, because guys have this thought that they know what aromatization is. They think they do. Testosterone is getting converted to estrogen. They think it's just, I think, happening out in the ether of their bloodstream that, you know, you're getting testosterone and then it's converting to estrogen and estrogen's floating around wreaking havoc. And that's not how it works. Um, in men and postmenopausal women, we get, we only get our, est or we only get our estradiol from testosterone, from aromatization, which we kind of understand that, you know, um, I'd say in men, not on TRT, 15% of it is made in the gonads, but we're shutting that down when we're on testosterone. So it's strictly aromatization. Aromatase is in target tissues at varying levels for a reason. So you need estrogen in the brain, in the chondrocytes of the bone in the endothelial cells lying in your vascular system, in the penis. So what happens is, and these papers show it, is estradiol acts as a paracrine hormone. So that means it's a locally acting hormone. It's not just floating around. So the levels you're seeing on blood tests are just sort of reflective of what might be going on at a tissue level. They're not what's directing things at a tissue level. And that's huge. When I first started reading this, I mean, that's another light bulb moment. It's like, you, you're blocking aromatase at all of those target sites that have different levels of aromatase for a reason. It's not like you're blocking it in the bloodstream. So we're just blocking it a little bit. That's not how it's working. You might be blocking it a little bit in one area and all of it in the brain. You, you don't know. And so it just, that's a huge deal. I wish more people, I, I keep harping on that every time guys bring up this estradiol spiking and all this stuff. It's like, and, and these papers even say it, serum levels in men and postmenopausal women really don't mean that much. So yeah, if it's low, if it's like zero or two, that's reflected that not much is getting converted. But if it's a hundred, that doesn't mean that much. That doesn't tell you what's going on at a tissue level. So 
I think that's that's a big deal. Yeah, it's um, you know all the studies that you, you see about you know they give they give a, a population uh, testosterone, their levels go up. Obviously, at, at estradiol raises as well, and they say oh they improved. You know these these people improved across the board. There's zero. There's no mention whatsoever of anything where they say, but we also controlled their estrogen and we kept their estrogen in this range. Like, you cannot find any data, any literature, any studies, anything where they specified in their study that they found the need to control estrogen in, in any amount. It's not even part of the equation. Right. They're simply talking about, about uh, testosterone. Well, and, they, and there's yeah. a study, I think it's on the paper you posted, estradiol as a male hormone, where they link, link, mention a study done Men on TRT versus men on TRT with an AI. None of the guys in the AI had the benefits that the men on TRT alone did. Like they showed the harm done with the AI. So we, I mean, there's just study after study. And, and a lot of these, those are on humans. There's, there's rat studies. When you block their estradiol, you block their libido. They stop having sex. You know, I mean, it's just because people don't realize that estradiol is a feel good hormone. It actually drives libido, protects your bones. Uh, cardiovascular health, all these things, it, it's gotten such a bad rap. And, you know, we can talk about this. Um, it's just a myth. It's, it's all these, sorry. Um, my mom's texting me. Uh, <laughs> it's a It's this bro. Everybody wants a scapegoat. You know, everybody wants to blame something. And a lot of this came from the bodybuilding world. They're like, oh, bro, I'm retaining water. It must be my estrogen. Oh, I'm acting like an asshole. It must be my estrogen. No. That's not what it is. You know, like if you're an a-hole to begin with, you're going to be an a-hole on steroids, you know, but people don't realize, especially now that we know how estradiol works. I mean, androgens are causing more of the water retention than just the estrogen. Estrogen is not just floating around out there wreaking havoc. And so they don't think like that though. They're like, Oh, I'm bloated. It must be estrogen. Cause they think about women and bloating. Well, women equals estrogen. They don't realize women have their mood disturbances every month when the estrogen drops, when it plummets, that's when they get the moodiness and the things we all associate with estrogen. It's not when the estrogen is high. So, no, not to mention when they're hitting menopause and their and their levels are dropping. Exactly. That's when all the issues start to kick in. The, the, the libido goes, their bones get brittle, they start getting osteoporosis, they start getting maybe they get some diabetes, they start putting on weight, they start getting all these all these things start occurring. And you give them estrogen and they improve. And they say, the people say, yeah, but that's because there are women. Well, are their brains different than ours? Are their cardiovascular systems different? Their hearts, uh, the endothelial, it, it, it's, we're, we're the same. Yes, our sex organs are different, but the rest of us is the same. How is it that this stuff is, is benefiting them to this extent, but somehow to us it would be a poison that would make us less than a man? It's absolutely well, and I'll give you ridiculous. some examples in men, um, which I had never done until this year, and I started looking into – Basically, estrogen add back in men who had to be castrate for metastatic prostate cancer. And, you know, this gets into people are like, oh, testosterone. Why do you castrate guys if testosterone didn't cause prostate cancer? Because removing it will regress the cancer. That's a different topic. But these guys lose their estradiol and they start getting all the menopausal symptoms that their wives have gone through. And they start getting hot flashes. They're thinking, I mean, I'll see these guys a month after starting them on Lupron injections and they've gone downhill so fast. They can't, their balance is off, their memory's impaired. So I started looking into estrogen add back. I talked to Dr. Nichols about it a little bit. And I said, I think that's reasonable to do in these guys because at least we can give them back their estradiol to help them feel better. And I, my first one, you know, my first guy I did it and put him on estradiol pills, two milligrams, I think twice a day. He comes back, he's like a new person. I'm not kidding. I mean, like totally different guy than I'd seen the prior month. His thoughts were there. He was like, yeah, doc, I'm going to my bowling tournament next week. I mean, it was crazy. So that again, light bulb moment, like this stuff works. Like, and so anyway, it's, it's just, we got a lot of misinformation that we need to correct. Um, and people are going to probably comment on YouTube about this. Oh, you don't know, you know estrogen. When my levels get this number, then I feel like this. You don't know that that's your estrogen doing it. I find the biggest the, 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 the biggest thing that I'm seeing is they say, as soon as I stop my AI, within a week, all these things happen. And I'm like, well, you've given it a week. You've just yeah. made a change where everything is going to start to fluctuate. That's you right. got to give this a good six, eight weeks and let the body balance out. Absolutely. And you could potentially feel worse before you feel better. I remember when I stopped my AI and I went cold turkey, I felt like garbage for two weeks. 
And every day I kept looking at that little pill bottle. I'm like, oh, this, if I take one, I know this, this bloat's going to go away and I know my erections are going to come back. And I, and I said, no, I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to see, down. I want to give it two months. And if it still doesn't work, then I can prove that it's, that it's nonsense. And sure enough, I did. Yeah. It, the, the messages I get, you know, the guy says, look at my E2. He says, I'm at 130. He says, meanwhile, I had sex with my wife three times today. Oh, I've got a guy's like 50. <laughs> like, I've got you several know? of that. Guys, when I, and I don't, I've kind of stopped checking that shit out because it's not going to change what we do. Because I'm not going to give, and this is public service announcement for anybody, um, I don't give aromatase inhibitors. I'm not going to do it. Um, I'm just not. I know the harm they can cause. You know, I try to get guys to understand, you know, we see this stuff all the time, guys like, oh, I got a little nipple sensitivity, I need an AI, or whatever. It's like, so you're willing to wreck your health with an AI because you got a little lump growing. When just riding it out, it may stabilize and regress. I mean, if you got the lump, you got to get it cut out if it bothers you. It's never going to go away, but it can regress. I've had it. I had a painful lump about a year and a half ago. Um, it's regressed now. I didn't take anything. I stopped. I was taking MK677, which is a growth hormone secretagogue. It was all from that, prolactin or IGF related. Mm -hmm. People think gyno is all estrogen related. It's not. You know, so anyway, we're I got to gyno with low estrogen. So, yeah, absolutely. Bodybuilders do it all the time. They, they, tons of these guys walk around with gyno that were not taking highly aromatizing compounds. You know, it's, it's a balance of androgens. It's, there's a lot going on there. I think most of it's probably genetic. Either you have that glandular tissue that is there or you don't uh and then any kind of hormonal fluctuation can flare it you know, that's yeah. any, my theory so like a video i did that talked about uh, multivitamins or minerals or supplements or whatever will make it would make it flare up yeah. and I'm, I'm taking more testosterone now than i ever had before not blocking my estrogen my estrogen's probably through the roof right now and that lump that I had by week after week it's just shrinking and shrinking there's actually a guy from the group that messaged me today he says my gyno has been shrinking dra dramatically since I took your advice and stopped the AI. He says, I don't understand that. He says, it goes against everything I've learned. Can you please explain? It's amazing. I said, I and, and people think we're crazy when we're saying this. It's like, what yeah. motive do we have to be promoting estrogen? Like, it, it's not about promoting estrogen. It's about not promoting AI use. You know what I mean? It's about promoting health. That's what I try to get guys to understand. I'm you know, on these forums and everything. It's like, you're on TRT because you want to be healthy, not just feel better. You want to be healthy. Um, bodybuilders, they probably don't care in the short term. So yeah, maybe blocking estrogen for them. It, it maybe it gets rid of that 0.05% of water retention that they need to have gone before a show, whatever. I mean, that's a whole different ball game, but we're not talking about that. Um, the argument usually is stuff like, well, you know, I'm, 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 I know that if you crash your E2, it's bad, but I'm not talking about crashing. I just want to bring it down a little bit. And I asked them, but what is, what is the reason? What did you saw that demonstrated the need to bring it down? That's right. What, what was it? What is, what will happen if it, if it goes up there? Yeah. What, 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 what was the thing that you saw or you read or in the literature that stated, I need to be bringing it down to whatever extent. I, I can't find any of that. And so far, here, no one's been able to send me that either. A, a big part of it is, and I see this with patients in all kinds of issues, not just hormones. Um, if you are told erroneously that you may have a side effect because of X, you will find a reason to have that side effect. So it's sort of like the nocebo effect. Um, so when guys are constantly hammered, oh yeah, man, estrogen, estrogen causes all these things. Well, then when they start feeling a little off, check their estrogen, it's, 90 80 whatever it's outside of the normal they freak out it's got to be estrogen no your protocol probably crap you know i mean it's especially worse for us guys that are like you said anal when you were saying you were doing the saturday morning and the tuesday night because yep. i did the same thing when i was doing the twice weekly yep. but then i read that high e2 symptoms were very similar to low e2 symptoms were you that type where it's like okay well i have this issue going on is it because my e2 is too high or is it because it's too low yep. and i got all that from google <sighs> You know, it's all Google searches because if you Google yeah. estrogen symptoms, you get a load of crap. Um, if you look into the actual literature, it's just not, it's not supported. And clinically, it's not supported. From what I'm seeing with guys, it's not supported. They're not having these high E2 symptoms. It just don't, it doesn't happen. Um, I mean, could you, could you theoretically get high E2 symptoms if you were taking exogenous estradiol? you like on maybe, I mean, because, you know, like I said, when you're converting the estradiol level in your blood is not reflective of what's going on in the tissues. So if you were taking it on top of what's converting, 
could that flood receptors then? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I have no idea. Just like too much testosterone can cause side effects. You know what I mean? Like a super high, super physiological. Well, the exogenous estradiol would throw off that ratio, that right. ratio right. that the equilibrium that the body is trying to take. And everybody's, everybody's ratio, you can't say, well, the number is, you know, one to 10 or whatever it is. Yeah. There's no specific number. There's some kind of ratio that's, you know, yeah. we're raising tea. Let estrogen just do what it's got it, to do. It's, it's if you're right. purposely raising it. Yeah, it, the ratio is going to be the natural ratio that your body needs. When you start adding stuff on top, you're skewing that ratio at that point. So bodybuilders, again, taking aromatizable compounds, nandrolones, boldenone, those compounds are not aromatizing to bioidentical estradiol. Those guys might actually benefit from taking bioidentical, especially if they're doing low testosterone, high of these other substances, because those estradiol forms are not going to be acting like your own natural and that's something i've seen i think i posted this you may have seen it. i had a guy who was on boldenone 600 milligrams a week which is equipoise and 300 milligrams of testosterone a week he didn't feel good didn't have erections wasn't taking an ai totally trust the guy levels came back with a testosterone of 1800 a free t of 50 his estradiol was seven Oof. no ai and I had to look into it and I found some obscure references on Reddit with guys with the same issue where I don't know if, estra if equipoise is acting like an AI. So a lot of these substances these guys are taking, they have no idea what's going on. They think they're getting overconverted to estrogen when they're in fact probably blocking aromatase and not realizing. Uh, anyway, so there's more research needs to be done with that, but nobody's going to research guys taking steroids. You know, it's just not going to happen. That's um, the thing. Um, Outside of... Um outside of just, let's say the cream with your patients, or do you, do you make any kind of general recommendations? Like, you know, I want you to take a DHEA or I want you to take Brignellone or I want you to take multivitamins. I want to take whatever. We, we do talk about multivitamins. I kind of tell them my stack, you know, which is, we all take different stuff for mainly for nitric oxide health. I, I'm a big fan of daily to daily Cialis. Obviously if they have ED, then yeah, but honestly just for the beneficial effects on the endothelium. Um, and it can help lower blood pressure a little bit, but I, I'm a big fan of daily Cialis, vitamin K2, to try to, you know, whether there's, whether that really works or not, as far as driving calcium into the bones and not into the arterial walls. I think there's more going on with plaque formation than just calcium. Um, I think the calcium is a bystander. It's not causing the harm and, but I'm not a cardiologist, but I, I'm, a, I'm always a contrarian. So I try to look into this stuff. Anyway. Is this also because of supplementing with, D, uh, with uh, vitamin D that they say that you need to take vitamin yep. K along with it? So that's what I do just because, you know, it seems beneficial. I don't see any harm in doing it. Um, other than that, a good fish oil. Uh, I think vitamin C is important, uh, again, for vascular health. I think I read a study where they gave dogs high-dose vitamin C that had coronary calcification and they actually reduced it. Whether that translates to humans, I don't know, but a gram of vitamin C a day is not going to probably hurt anybody. Um, the DHA pregnenolone thing, I know Dr. Keith is big on this, uh, on, on giving it, and I don't disagree with him. It's just, I've tried it myself, like you have. I feel like I felt worse on both. I've tried pregnenolone, tried DHA, D, yeah, DHEA. Um, I think in my patients, if I feel like they're not getting dialed in, you know, something's off, then we start checking the level, especially DHA sulfate. Um, but most guys I have, they they feel good once they get on TRT and, and stick it out for a while. I mean, it, it, it's just, and I see conflicting things about DHEA, uh, you know, what it converts to a, a different form of estradiol. So it's not even estradiol. It's like androstene diol, things that can affect, that actually act on estrogen receptors and maybe block them. So too much of DHEA, that may be why it's causing some side effects in guys because it's actually a, an antagonizing certain receptors that don't need to be antagonized. Um, but I'm, I'm open to changing my mind on that. I'm not against either one of those, but I'm not a big believer in the HCG to fill backfill the pathways. Now I'm going to get reamed out probably on YouTube for saying that, but I, I heard Dr. Chrysler say it. It's all over Excel mail. Um, I love Nelson. Those guys have, have changed their views on AIs, which is awesome. But the, the HCG thing is still pretty set in stone with those guys to backfill the pathways. And, just because somebody found a star molecule in the big adrenal process that responds to LH, that doesn't mean you have to take HCG to replenish those levels. Um, you know, the studies, I, I looked into this, I think maybe guys on TRT, exogenous hormones, reduce DHEA pregnenolone maybe 
when they get on. Is that enough to need HCG? I don't think so. I think HCG can cause more, more issues than it helps. It definitely uh, did with me. That's for sure. And it definitely does with a lot of the guys I speak to yep. as well. Yep. I'll do it for fertility maintenance. Uh, but other than that, I don't really recommend it. If they want to do it, that's fine. I just tell them they may feel worse. And I'll have it. How about uh, stuff like uh, metformin? I, I get a lot of conflicting, you know, yes, you should absolutely be taking it and no, you shouldn't. Uh, it has a uh, will degrade performance or whatever it is. What's your, uh, what's I'm your take torn. on that? I'm torn. Um, I was a big proponent of it. The more I was kept reading about it, I was listening to Peter, I think it's Peter Atia's podcast several months ago and he, he was really for it. And now he came out with another one where he's like, eh, maybe not. There's definitely reduction in mTOR pathways, um, which can hamper probably a little bit of muscle growth. I mean, is it clinically significant? I don't know. Um, especially for bodybuilders, it's probably not. Those guys taking GH, they need to be on metformin, I think, to keep their insulin sensitivity high. And they're taking enough anabolics that it doesn't matter if their mTORs reduce this much. For us regular mortals um, on TRT, I don't, I don't know yet, honestly. I don't think it's probably harmful long term. Um, there's so many studies on it showing benefit here and there, but a lot of these are on diabetics, you know. So it's we need actually studies done on people that are healthy and long-term studies. So it may be 20 years from now before we know that and I'll be 60 by then. So exactly. Um, I don't have a problem with people taking it. I have noticed this though, you get guys on testosterone replacement who are diabetic. They're, if they're on insulin, their insulin needs will go down. Uh, if they're on metformin, they can often cut their metformin dose. So I'm a huge proponent of TRT for my diabetic guys. Um, even if they're not always symptomatic and that's something that's controversial. Um, you know, treating guys, and I'm not saying I'm treating them if their testosterone is 800, but none of my diabetic older guys have testosterone that are normal. They're all in the 200s or 100s almost. And this probably is a whole nother topic we could talk about, but where do I, what's my protocol for treating guys? You know, because th this is my soapbox is all these guys all over the world getting denied TRT that are symptomatic. And we're so in love with these normal ranges that we're, we're just not willing to see people for people and realize they can have symptoms, even if their labs are normal. Um, I think there really is something to the andro androgen resistance uh, that Dr. Nichols talks about. I think it's Dr. Carruthers in England wrote a book on this. Dr. Morgan Teller endorsed him. I mean, so that, that's huge when you got, you know, the top urologist in the country doing testosterone research, writing a forward in a book on a guy talking about androgen resistance saying, yeah, we're going to treat based on symptoms, not numbers alone. And so a lot of guys I'll see will have normal T. They have all the symptoms. Check free T. It's almost always low. So, and not low on the lab range, but low compared to where we like to keep it. So I'm, I'm willing to treat those guys if they're symptomatic. I tell them a trial of testosterone is not unreasonable. Jordan, I got to say, I'm really happy to finally have convinced you to uh, hop online uh, with me. And uh, I think once everyone sees these videos, there's going to be a lot more uh, requests for you to have uh, on. And we can do a, maybe a doctor's roundtable and discuss a few topics. Yep. So uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on. It was not as nerve wracking as I uh, thought. <laughs> <laughs> now you got to hear awesome. my accent. So There you go. Okay, guys, until next time, if you haven't already subscribed, uh, please do. The link is uh, below. And uh, if you haven't already, please feel free to check out our Facebook group with the same name, TRT and Hormone Optimization. Uh, feel free to look me up on Facebook, Danny Bossa. Uh, you can send me a PM over there. Uh, and Jordan Grant is in the group as well. Um, that's about it. You guys have yourself a great weekend. Thanks, guys.